Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Fred Goldstein. I'm uh, principal of Ionary Consulting. And I'm here to start the third panel, talk about telecom policy going forward, and talk about how we could have competitive change leading to what we could call the case for a second divestiture. Current policy presumes competition. Doesn't mean there is competition. We have a FCC policy that pretends the competition exists. Competition is better than regulation when the market can be truly competitive. Permitting competition, though, doesn't necessarily make it happen. If there's a natural monopoly, then that means the competitor's cost is much higher than the incremental cost to the incumbent, so the incumbent can undersell any competitor and knock them out. That's what happens with things like uh, fi you know, fiber optic to the premise. It's a problem. What's needed is to identify the realistic level of competition, regulate the remaining monopolies, encourage upgrades via the regulatory process, don't regulate what doesn't need to be regulated, and also, big problem, what can be competitive can change over time. Now, the MFJ, the 1984 divestiture, did recognize this. It knew what was competitive at the time, but it put in place a rigid framework here is AT&T, here are the bells. It wasn't a currently competitive, currently uh, monopoly that would change. It was a static move. And therefore, since the world has changed, technology has changed, we need to revisit that. Deregulation of a monopoly is counterproductive. That's what we've gotten. So who can afford to pull fiber and on what terms? The rules keep changing. So let's not focus on the services, the current model. Let's focus on the network elements. Let's try layering as a roadmap to competition. I have three different colors here. How competitive is the element? The bottom, the pink, is a natural monopoly. Now that means it's a duopoly or oligopoly here and there. The duopoly with cable is a technical and regulatory accident. We're fortunate. So, but that's the natural monopoly. Then we have lit fiber. We have bulk transmission. That is generally competitive, especially in urban areas. But in a rural area, you can tell by the price of special access, it's a monopoly. So that's a borderline case. And on top, the green area is competitive. The green light, internet routing, telephone switching. The price of a telephone switch in 1984 was very high. The price of a switch today is a tiny fraction of that, and any Tom, Dick, and Harry CLEC can have a perfectly full function switch. And you can use VoIP technology and even open source technology to build a switch nowadays. Internet content should be inherently competitive so long as the underlying networks are. Those wire layers are the key. But what we have is a model of vertical integration. That's the current business model. Kevin Martin's FCC believed in quote-unquote facilities-based competition, which meant that to compete at the higher layer of content, you had to own the facilities at the bottom layer. So they had AT&T vertically integrated, Verizon vertically integrated. The cable company is a little bit less integrated. The local ISP was supposed to be integrated. Wait a second. That can't happen. One of these things is not like the other. So what happened, most of the ISPs went out of business. It was war on the ISPs. Let's set the clock back. Computer 2, a wonderful decision. The FCC made this decision in 1981. It was as important, probably more important, than divestiture. Divestiture changed the ownership of the stock. Computer 2 changed the structure of the industry functionally. Under Computer 2, the telephone companies could only provide basic services under tariff. Enhanced services became unregulated and had to be provided through a fully separate subsidiary. It was treated like a competitor. They had to eat their own dog food, order the same way their competitors ordered. In the late 80s, that was relaxed. The Bells got the FCC to relax it. They kept pushing back. Computer 3, we can have accounting safeguards rather than structural safeguards. But the computer decisions made the public internet possible. It meant that you could get open entry for ISPs, enhanced service providers. The old term under CI, enhanced service over basic service, when the Telecom Act of 1996 came along, they came up with fairly similar terminology for fairly similar, not identical, but fairly similar distinction, information services that run over telecommunications. So that's where we are now legally. It's just that the current, well, the outgoing FCC, the one that was in effect last year, didn't believe in it. It wasn't controversial. The Telecom Act didn't enshrine Computer 2 because no one thought anyone was going to throw it out. 
The FCC revoked Computer 2. 2005, they adopted DACA 02-33 and repealed it effective 2006. So therefore, the raw DSL, the bit neutral common carrier transmission was redefined as part of the information service. The telephone company stopped being a phone company with an ISP buying service, became an ISP owning the wire, didn't have to provide service to other ISPs. They still do on contract. It's not that the ISPs have all been knocked off, but they can be knocked off any time the contract expires, and that kills investment in the ISP business. The FCC falsely claimed this was ordered by the Supreme Court in the Brand X case. I've read Brand X. I'm not a lawyer, but it says very clearly, this is about cable. It is not about DSL. They lied when they said that it was ordered. The ILX don't have to sell to ISPs. Therefore, net network neutrality became a problem. When there's open access to ISPs, an ISP misbehaves, the customers move. They don't even have to change the wires. When there's two ISPs, there's a risk that they'll both misbehave. There should not be a question of neutrality. The FCC has, their, their favorite term was vibrant competition, is Vestia and Pravda. <laughs> <laughs> the FCC's three-front war on ISPs, this was a war on ISPs. That was what all this anti-competitive behavior was about. The Powell-Martin FCC wanted to help the incumbent Lex put the ISPs out of business. Yes, hurt the CLEX too, but they served ISPs. The CLEX were collateral damage. First attack the CLEX doing dial-up. 2001, everybody was on dial-up. So it mattered. Get rid of reciprocal compensation that financed the dial-up business on ISP calls. And a lot of states banned, not a lot, but several states banned virtual and XX, which is the only way to have dial-up in a non-local area, in rural areas. Also, get rid of unbundling. So the CLEX can't do competitive broadband, how COVAD operates, unbundled wire. Harder and harder to get unbundling, much less unbundling. They did away with line sharing, which made consumer DSL competitive. So COVAD can sell to business, it's a higher price service. No access to ILEC fiber. They call this new rules for new networks. But that means the ILEC only builds a closed network. No ISP access to the glass. What good is glass if it's only carrying Pravda and Asvestia? Third, take away the common carrier obligations of the ILEX so the ISPs themselves can't buy from them. Let's look at the two big uh, ILEX. AT&T has U-verse. This is a late lake kicker, we call that. They take the old technology, the wire network. This comes out of the FCC's fiber policy, which allows them to do this. It's not fiber to the home. It's VDSL, very high-speed DSL. Fiber to the neighborhood, copper to the house. What's the point of this? It's a very good point. They're doing exactly what the shareholders want, getting the most out of the old copper plant. Not a stupid idea. Not a good one for performance, but they're stretching it until Verizon, by buying a lot of stuff, lowers the cost of the fiber parts. Switch digital video, 20 megabits or less, depending on where you are, on the VDSL, it's not broadcast video, but it's functionally broadcast if you don't have too many TV sets. <laughs> Under the previous FCC in 1999-2000, they had a different DSL plant at SBC called Project Pronto. The FCC had rules that were very pro-competitive. It let them do it. But when the new FCC came in, Pronto went out the door. u new rules came in. No DSL common carriage. So it could offer ISP access. There's no technical reason, but the FCC doesn't require it. All you have are some commercial agreements with ISPs to use the DSL. Uh, question. does that. Well, next slide. <laughs> Verizon Fios, well, that's, that's a special case in the building, in the, in the apartment building. Verizon Fios is basically a closed fiber to the home. It's BPON or GPON technology. These are not the most competitive ways to build a fiber optic plant. The splitters are located in the aerial plant, sort of a tree of branching fibers. It minimizes the number of strands. Strands of fiber are cheap. Many houses share a port, and there's broadcast TV like cable HFC going on a different Lambda. So it really is not designed for a multi-user network, multi-service provider network. And so there's no broadband unbundling. It fits the current rules perfectly. You could have so-called bitstream unbundling, which is common carriage of a bit rate, but that's, again, not required. The installers even come, when you order Fios to your house, they cut the copper wire, unless you have some very good tricks to stop them. They cut the wire, 
anti-competitive. Now you don't like Fios. Oh, I'm sorry, there's no copper wire to your house, no drop. It'll cost you hundreds of dollars to go back. Most ISPs and CLEX cannot deal with that. It is technically allowed, but it is extremely difficult to do. So the point is, Fios is a lock-in. There are other ways to do fiber to the home with competition. Strand for home, wavelength, division, multiplexing pond, lumped pond, where you run the, all the pond equipment in a cabinet. And therefore, you can switch from one pond to another by plugging it in. Can we go back, set the clock back, and restore a competition? Well, the framework in 2000 was very pro-competitive. The previous FCC was pro-competition. Computer 2 and 3 for ISPs. All the network elements are unbundled, copper, fiber, switching, transport, loops. CLEX could get access to the remote terminals in order to put their own devices in the remote terminal to do DSL uh, out in the field. The ILEX, however, cited the phrase necessary, and another word, impair. Necessary for competition, its absence would impair competition. Wording in the Telecom Act, seemed namby-pamby at the time, but they got the courts to use this to overturn most competition. So the ILEX still have the natural monopoly. They've got the only way to reach most subscribers because they built it when they had a de jure monopoly. The law, they were the only carrier. Sure, you're allowed to compete, but you can't. Fios and ILEC fiber to the home are essentially unregulated. So they lock out the CLEX, they lock out the ISPs. It's a tool to monopolize the content. Easy, short-term fixes. They could restore a computer two and three. There's no requirement Okay, that did not come out of Brand X. They could restore computer two and three, or computer two, and have common carriage. This would fix network neutrality without regulating the internet. If you had orthodox neutrality and some guy sat in Bryant Park and wanted to run a file server to run video, it could knock out the whole damn network and you couldn't say no. That's stupid. ISPs should be free to do what they want, carry what they want, protect their networks as they want, but they should be able to get bits from a common carrier at a regulated price. Cable was never a common carriage. The Brand X changed nothing. It affirmed the Cable Act of 1992. The Triennial Review in 2003 took away unbundling. Triennial Review every three years. Well, there was one in 2000. Then there's one in 2003 that killed the CLEX uh, at six years. And there's no Triennial Review. What's going on? We're overdue, folks. I hope Janachowski is listening. And the forbearance of basic obligations. They've even, some of the ILEX quest in Omaha said, oh, we'll forbear from the rule to unbundle loops. You can't even lease a loop in Omaha. No unbundled loops because Cox has more than 50% of the telephone lines. And that's enough competition for quest. That was the FCC's ruling. Likewise, in Anchorage, where GCI did the same thing. Uh, inner office transport, middle mile that's called special access when you get it from the ILEC. The rates were set in 1992 based on the cost of a telephone toll to make up for lost tolls on voice. Voice grade equivalent. It's incredibly expensive. That's got to be brought down to a cost-based level. The 200% rate of return today is ridiculous. So a future FCC, here's the problem. A future FCC, if the administration change, could roll these back again. So if we get a good FCC, we have sit four or eight good years, then what? How do we have regulatory certainty, which is what you need to get investment, to get the economy rolling? Best answer is separation. Have two different companies. Now, there's two forms of separation, structural and functional. Functional separation means the ILEC has competitive and monopoly operations. They're fully separate operations. That's what Computer 2 did when it took the competitive operations like PBXs, enhanced services, put them in a fully separate subsidiary. British Telecom, BT, has a separate subsidiary called Open Reach. They only sell wholesale services, the loops, basic transmission. The rates are regulated. BT Retail, the other company, purchases the facilities from them on the same grounds as any other company who wants to use Open Reach. What has this done to BT's profits? They've gone up. BT, they were going up. They went down 10% on the market today. They're doing this worse than and that's because the economy sucks. But during the first year of Open Reach, it went up. The BT wanted this, though. BT wanted this. And the point, yeah, it, was, it was BT's idea to have functional separation. And it has the potential to raise their profits. Other European countries are evaluating one form or the other of separation. I mean, when the short-term fluctuation of the stock market and the way the economy is now is a special case. But yeah. I understand, but even that's affected by the economy. Short-lived FSS American Bell. Anybody remember American Bell? In 1983, that lasted one year because that's what Computer 2 created, all the competitive stuff there. But then the vestiture went to AT&T residuary. 
rather than developed companies. So now the office, the other form of separation is called structural separation, and that's what 1984 was all about. Split an ILEC into two unrelated companies. We'll call them, in this case, Loop Co. and the Service Co. Divestiture two, full-fledged divestiture. So let's look at how that would work. A Loop Co. and a Service Co. Monopoly and competitive lines. Well, here's a Loop Co. at the bottom. It owns the poles, the ducts, the wire. It's rate of return regulated. It's a utility. Good old-fashioned utility, good old-fashioned, you know, widows and orphan stock. Can it carry a heavy debt load? It's, an, you know, people who don't want to worry about the competitive world, deal with it. Lit fiber bulk transmission, well, in some areas it's competitive, in some areas it's not. Loop Co. is the regulated provider of last resort, especially important for rural areas. But then everything else, telephone switching, internet, that's all competitive. So the former ILEC service company is just like the CLEX. It leases facilities. ISPs lease facilities. Anybody who wants to lease these facilities, they're open. And this is open freedom, bit neutral. There's no IP in the Loop Co. It does not know what IP is. It only deals in glass, copper, and occasionally bits. How would a Loop Co. be regulated? Rate of return. The PUC in each state would negotiate the rate of return and what the appropriate service level is. They'd negotiate what's not padding the rate base, what's the right level of investment. Optimize the facilities for open access. Don't build them for one provider like Fios. Only wholesale to service providers, no competing with the wholesale customers, covenant in the articles to create them, never, ever, ever offer retail services such as telephone or IP switching. No restrictions on sharing and resale. They, they can use your facility. They can't ask what you're doing with a wire. Absolutely open, neutral, because this is, even Spamford can have it, because it's not internet. Small rural ILEX, by the way, they're on rate of return regulation. They're not affected. You, don't, you can't split them uh, to do companies that are too small. Service code, the rump ILEC, is almost like a CLEC. It inherits the retail subscribers. It's required, at least temporarily, to rent the wire of the Loop Co. Um, but they all become tenants of the Loop Co's carrier hotels. And the retail rates become deregulated once there's sufficient competition. Intercarrier termination, and that's net monopoly on the terminating line, has to stay regulated for everybody. Tandem switching, probably. Public safety, all the consumer protection rules stay in effect for the rump ILEC service code, as they do for CLEX. Financial implication, the ILEX shareholders are in a better position. There's two specialized stocks. Loop Co. can have more debt to higher ratio. Loop Co. is a union shop, probably. That's where the union workers will mostly go. Less duplication of physical facilities is the net gain for the economy. One fiber is plenty to the home. It just has to be open. Service providers, I say one fiber provider, it might be more than one strand. Uh, service providers can focus on adding value, not wasteful trenching. Every ISP doesn't have to dig a trench. Capital, to dig all these redundant trenches, is not in plentiful supply. When a fiber can only reach 25 or 50 percent of houses, it's not going to get financed today. When it's Loop Co. and can go to every house uh, as a utility, it's more likely to get financed. The aggregated demand makes it work. Cable company can even buy in because their hybrid fiber coax is going to run out of steam. So they can go, they're right now they split the nodes, but eventually they're going to go to fiber to the home. That's what they're talking about now. Fiber architecture. Cable companies don't own their own cable trucks. They hire contractors. They'd be happy if it was a structurally separated company, they could have the Loop Co. provide them with a fiber upgrade too. So it's a win-win. It's a win for the cable company, it's a win for telco, it's a win for the public. Only the ILEC CEOs who lose a little bit of that ego are the ones who would lose, but you know, it's, it's, that's time. And the universal service obligation, the last bit here, right now we have this complicated universal service system that funds retail services. That needs to be moved to fund the facilities so that it becomes not portable to different service providers, but the loop code gets the loop support, not the service code, and therefore everybody gets shares the support, and we don't need as many subsidies. Right now there's duplicate support taking place for duplicate plant. That's, that does not make a lot of sense. We need to have a better regulated universal service system. Thank you. Dot com website, I have a draft, I'm going to put up a draft separations bill I've written. 
uh, just a state level bill for how separation can work in the details. It, it's very complex and interesting. We'll have it up the, you know, next week on the website. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep this really short because it's getting late and uh, there's been a lot of good stuff tonight. Um, the uh, community fiber project is uh, a community based approach where grassroots uh, groups can work together to solve their local community last mile problem. It's, it's not a problem that necessarily scales. It's not a citywide or nationwide solution. But in small, dense populations, it seems uh, very realistic that one could uh, collaborate with their neighbors and uh, get gigabit networks up and running. Uh, I assume that all of us have uh, gigabit lands at, at home that cost us 50 bucks from Linksys or the equivalent. Um, why not uh, that make that kind of speed available to your neighbors on either side? Sharing a cable modem doesn't make sense with your neighbor. There isn't much to gain. Uh, but if you can get at the end of it into a carrier neutral meet me room, um, then you're in a truly competitive bandwidth environment. And uh, the business model is centered around it being a nonprofit initiative uh, that uh, all the, the, the full expense uh, is, you know, a vast majority of the expense is incurred up front. Uh, so uh, any expense declines as uh, additional, as the uptake increases. So why not uh, have the cost decline over time and have as the, you know, as the number of subscribers increases, uh, have the cost go down as well. Uh, you don't need to share your gigabit connection with your neighbor. Uh, that you're, you know, on a uh, subscriber basis, uh, you would want to sign up your neighbor because when everyone signs up, the price goes down to approaching nothing. Um, uh, one, another possible aspect of the business model might be uh, the installation requirements in different buildings, different settings is quite different. If you have an aerial installation, farther out in the boroughs, it's much cheaper than if you have to work with underground conduit. Uh, if you're in a structure where you can run an aerial line up to the side of the building, it's much cheaper than if you have to bore through, you know, dig up the sidewalk and bore through some masonry. So uh, perhaps that could be directly passed along. Uh, how do you handle network saturation? Uh, the users who uh, cause uh, full saturation on a connection, those who are contributing the majority of the traffic pay, in essence, a, a peak capacity fee that goes into a fund that's used to upgrade the network uh, when the fund reaches the appropriate level. Um, ad hoc expansion, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, one approach is doing home run fibers to the home, uh, which is probably the most costly approach. Another approach is to spread out uh, where you, you allow neighbors, you, you don't prohibit in the terms of service, uh, neighbors from connecting laterally over to their other, to, you know, nearby neighbors. And you enable it to spread organically. Um, and uh, is it a threat to uptake? Well, if you structure it in a way where the price decreases as more people get on board, then, uh, and you have some official mechanism, a multi-WAN router of sorts where uh, it intends to pass the connection along, and that's part of the architecture. Um, maybe you can address these things. Uh, why do this in New York City? Because um, I thought it would be a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, if you can make it work here, you can make it work anywhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, this is an initiative that's underway. Um, the uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority um, has several hundred miles of rail line. Uh, it's nice and big, and you can run things in it relatively easily compared to underground conduit in an unknown state. Um, the New York City uh, franchise agreement uh, arrangements specify that a certain number of fibers that are run by uh, fiber, fiber optic, uh, you know, the cable companies and local high speed telecommunication franchisees. Um, are to be given to the city between locations of the city's choosing. Uh, by estimates I've heard, about 40% of that is actually in use. So if 60% of the city-owned fiber is sitting dark on the ground, uh, that's an unused public asset that I'd like to see uh, community groups have access to. Um, 
Uh, uh, so that's that's the New York City Community Fiber Project, and uh, I welcome everyone's participation. This will uh, take the effort of many and, and dedication of many people. So please um, get involved. While we're getting started, I usually start off any talk I give by asking people how many people in the room use Wi-Fi, but given the, uh, given the current population, I think that uh, that's probably a fruitless question. Uh, but uh, as we get started here, uh, my name is Dana Spiegel. I run NYC Wireless. Uh, Joe here is one of our board members, uh, and I uh, wanted to thank him for, for today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about spectrum policy and talk a little bit about sort of what we do because wireless, uh, wireless, uh, community wireless projects really are a sort of special case in this whole regulatory regime because we don't, we're really customers. We're really just like you as, a, as an end user uh, when it comes to regulation and policy. But by the same token, we're also just like uh, just like a, uh, a telephone company in terms of the need for spectrum regulation uh, and the need for for uh, well maybe not like a telephone company but uh, but we're like an like an ILAC or a CLAC or whatnot. Um, so I'm going to run through this really quick. Stop me if you've heard it. Uh, first, I, I just wanted to start off. Someone asked uh, about, you know, what does mesh wireless have to do uh, to help uh, the current situation? And I wanted to just start off with this one quote from David Eisenberg's blog, who you know, probably most of you read. Uh, Broadband equals fiber. Let's stop beating around the bush. This is, by the way, Tim Nolte, who is a former GM of Burlington Telecom. Let's stop beating around the bush. Indeed, let's stop using the word broadband. It has been abused by, to the point of being useless and specifically used to obscure the facts in favor of incumbents who want to continue selling off their obsolete copper, all other fixed medium technologies, DSL, DOCSIS, BPL, or rubbish, bad stopgaps designed to get a few more years of service out of incumbent systems, wireless options, and I am a big agreeer of, of this statement, uh, Wi-Fi, WiMAX, and 4G are useful add-ons to a fiber foundation infrastructure, but they are not substitutes for it. So if anything comes out of all of this today, it is that there is no substitute for free and open, for, not, for open fiber. Wireless is not going to solve your problems. DSL is not going to solve your problems. Cable is not going to solve your problems. WiMAX, forget about. 4G, forget about. None of this stuff is going to solve your problems. But that being said, there's a lot of stuff that Wi-Fi can do, and we can sort of look at it as a stopgap measure until we get to a point of, hopefully in the future, full divestiture. Uh, so community wireless, very, very briefly, it's worldwide. We started out in 2000. We were one of the first couple of uh, community wireless providers out there. Uh, we, we had the somewhat unique perspective of wanting to not bring, use Wi-Fi to bring internet into homes, but rather use, use Wi-Fi to bring internet from homes out into public spaces. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of it, if I do say so myself. There's a tremendous number of New York City parks that are that offer free Wi-Fi internet. We were really the drivers of a multi, I think it's a multi-billion dollar industry, which is the Wi-Fi internet cafe business that Starbucks has popularized. All of that stuff would not exist were it not for the interest that people saw, uh, or that company saw in people being able to take their laptop off of their desk, either at work or at home, and use it somewhere that was outside of their home or work premises. Uh, so we use you know, open source and all of that stuff. Uh, one thing that we've learned is that there is no single solution. So this is one of the reasons why I really like Lou's uh, perspective on things, because his is a local solution that, address, that helps local, uh, local people solve their own problems uh, very explicitly uh, and doesn't try to enforce a universal solution across everyone. We actually recently in New York City had some research that was done uh, looking at a uh, potential uh, citywide Wi-Fi uh, muni network. And one of the things that came out of that research, which still hasn't been released to the public, but that's another story, uh, that, the, that, the, that we've all paid for was that 
there is no such thing as a single solution that will work for New York City. So why should we even think that if New York City can't have a, a single solution, that anywhere else in the country could have any possibility of a single solution for anything? And that's one of the problems that we have with, uh, with you know, telephone service is that even back when it was a, you know, a properly regulated monopoly, it even then didn't solve everyone's problems. And that's why you had things that, that uh, came out in the 80s and, and the entire computer revolution and all of that. So if you don't know what our hardware looks like, it looks like this. We've got, that's a flat antenna in the middle and a, an omnidirectional and an omnidirectional antenna on top. This is one of our hotspots that's operating on 14th Street and 8th Avenue. Uh, the antenna, in case you didn't notice, is actually facing down, but the antenna doesn't care which direction it's facing in. Uh, this stuff will survive a hurricane, by the way. This, this stuff is, uh, can be buried under feet of snow, and it still, still gives you good, uh, good Wi-Fi in the park. Um, this is what our hotspot landing pages look like, especially this is Madison Square Park's hot, what, previous version of their hotspot landing page. So basically, the way that it works is you open up your laptop, and you get the first uh, web page you browse to is one of our hosted login pages, and then you can you know just log in and continue on. Uh, this is what our map looks like. This is an installation that we did at Shake Shack, which is a very popular one in Madison Square Park. This is what we do in low-income housing community uh, developments. We actually go in and install for free. They pay for the equipment. Uh, we install for free. The, uh, the hardware to give them free internet access. They actually have to also pay for ISP as well, uh, and so on. So some Spectrum stuff. Uh, I'm going to post this online, so I'm probably not going to hit all the points, and, but you can read about it. TV White Spaces was a fight that we recently won, but it's not done yet. Uh, the FCC approved TV White Spaces for use for wireless broadband internet service, wide area. Um, and it's useful for both rural and urban, although maybe not in New York City, and that's mostly Broadway's fault. Uh, but the fight's not over because the NAB and the Association for Maximum Service Television filed a lawsuit of, a couple of weeks ago uh, wanting to shut down the FCC's order. It's going to be a, a long and messy road to continue fighting along, but uh, one of the interesting things that Wi-Fi has done in, and you will see this on both sides of the fight, uh, is that in the case of TV white spaces, we've attracted new, new, uh, not so much competitors, but new lobbies against us, meaning the people that want to bring internet to the masses. So it's not just a telecom lobby anymore. Now we've got to worry about the broadcast and Broadway lobby as well. Um, so Wi-Fi is not fiber, but it does get better. There was a recent post on Muni Wireless by Ken Biba, who was, uh, is the CTO of Novarum on 802.11n. That's the latest uh, work version of Wi-Fi. Uh, and basically, they did a whole lot of research. And they basically found that you, what you deploy today with 802.11g radios, that's the stuff that we use that is in most of your laptops, is actually there's significant benefits for 802.11n. Uh, you get much better coverage, much lower retry rates, and all with a lower power output. And basically what this means is that with a simple radio upgrade, you actually get much better service in a larger area for lower, for, with lower spectrum usage if you upgrade to N as a community wireless network or a muni network. So this just sort of shows that you know, every few years there's upgrades that enhance Wi-Fi and provide better service. But that doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's sort of a stopgap. It just incrementally gets better and better, and, but it's never going to reach fiber. There's no way we're going to get there for another you know, dozen or two dozen years. Um, so some problems. We still need a landline, just so you, you're clear. And, and this is a huge, huge problem in New York City. Because if you've ever tried to get a landline in New York City to anything that's not a building, a, a residence, or an office building, good luck. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> We try to get it into park buildings. And this is a, Joe can tell you, because he's logged hundreds of hours on the phone with Covad and, and Verizon most recently, a few weeks ago, that if, you, if Verizon says you don't exist, then there's very little hope in you ever getting service there. And this is a huge problem, too, because of the fact that we can't make use of cable modem services. So we're actually, because of terms of service limitations, we only can use either business grade DSL from Verizon, or thankfully, independent ISPs like Joe's DSL. Um, so interference is a huge sorry, B-way. Uh, 
Interference is, interference is a huge issue. Uh, so we're, when we're talking about spectrum issues, you know, white spaces are great because they offer new spectrum, but we have huge issues with the current spectrum. Uh, new York City sees this first. We're lucky to live in the city that never sleeps well. Neither do our uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, neither does the Wi-Fi spectrum. And actually, we saw. Uh, as early as a few years ago, a situation where the number of wireless routers that you can see on your laptop is bigger than your screen in terms of the options that you have to select. And when that happens, that means that the router that's right across the room is unavailable to you, regardless of your cha the channel that you want to use. So we've made this incredible industry out of this tiny, tiny little sliver of spectrum. And what we need is a lot more. Uh, and I won't talk about it much, but there's a huge issue with uh, the three A's. So there's availability, that's what a lot of people talk about, where I can't get any connectivity. So that's a problem, obviously. It's a, it's a drop dead problem if you are affected by it. Um, but a lot of people can get a lot of people can get access, but they can't afford it. Right? And that's a, huge, a much bigger problem. And competition addresses that, and regulation may address that, and all of that. Uh, but there's one problem that people are only starting to grapple with right now, and that's accessibility or value. Uh, and, and that is that basically it's, it, it's acknowledging the fact that those people that see the value in the Internet will do whatever it takes to get access to the Internet, regardless of how expensive it is and what they need to do to bring the line to them. Up to a point, but pretty much if you've got to spend 120 bucks to get access to satellite Internet, and that's the only thing available to you, that's what you're going to do. But 50% of our population doesn't see any value in getting access to the internet. And that's a bigger issue that we're only starting to deal with right now. Um, so what's the future? Obviously, tremendous value for low income and underprivileged residents. Uh, we've, we've dealt with this a lot. Uh, the no single solution uh, situation. So uh, the Frankston asked, I, I, can't, I can't claim to, not that anyone necessarily can, I'm claim to understand what Bob Frankston talked talks about most of the time, but the one thing that he's totally right about is that local solutions are the best solutions. So, you know, Lou, I know you'll appreciate this, that, you know, we really should be driving for getting local solutions and, and letting each community uh, be able to solve their own problems in an affordable and uh, appropriate way. Uh, so I talked about how we have new, new uh, enemies and the new lobbies that we've attracted, but we've also attracted, on the other side, a huge set of uh, other organizations that are our friends and allies. So we've got the community wireless. We've also got the media reform movement and the low power FM movement who have been working for decades to try to address the issues in their industries. But now we're all working together, uh, hopefully. Um, we definitely need more unlicensed spectrum, and you know, I'll leave with this. I'll end with the statement that the uh, public's resource, which is the spectrum, the the EM spectrum, should be given back to the public uh, through more spectrum made available in unlicensed uh, ways. Um, and I'll, yeah, that's about it. Um, been a long night, so I've cut about half of what I was going to talk about. Maybe then, hopefully, there'll still be some time for us to talk about what you want to talk about. What I'm going to do is I'm going to weave back and forth between regulation and litigation. And then I'm going to try to explain what I think is a vision on how we can go forward in both venues from here. Everybody's been talking about the 1984 divestiture of AT&T. But what if you realize is that that was not the only time the government took on AT&T. They started in 1913. They did it again in 1925. They did it again in 1956. And then in 1974, they started the investigation and the actions that ultimately culminated in the divestiture, which was... Uh, the order was the modification of final judgment. You hear people talk about the MFJ. What they're really talking about is technically what the 1984 decree was about was a modification of the 1956 decree. But the point here is that on average, in between 1913 
1974, the federal government, the Justice Department, found it necessary to sue AT&T under the antitrust laws every 13 years. How long has it been there? <laughs> 96 was the, the uh, uh, amendments to the Communications Act that basically dismantled the MFJ. It was the 84 decree um, that was the last time they really took them on. Now, um, where are we today with the courts? Well, I guess what, two weeks ago, when a regulatory structure exists to deter and remedy any competitive harm, the costs of antitrust enforcement are likely to be greater than the benefits. It's a concurring decision, concurring opinion by Justice Breyer in the link line decision that was mentioned earlier. What we're basically being told by the courts is that when it comes to telecom, we're not going to mess with the antitrust because there's this well-greased regulatory machine out there that's supposed to take care of it. Well, I tell you what, it is well-greased, but it's not the kind that they're talking about. <laughs> So what has our well-greased regulatory machinery been doing? Well, let's see. They go to the 96 amendments. They spend their time regulating and taxing little VOIP companies that got zero market power while completely getting rid of all regulation on the people who have the essential facilities. They, uh, they can't resolve some intercarrier compensation things that have been just destroying in the industry, the CLEC and, and ILEC industry, ever since the 96 Act. They won't enforce the rules. They let the ILECs regulate all the competitors. Um, the one thing that they were really good at doing, they eliminated the line of business restrictions in the 96 Act. All the ILECs now got all the rights that were originally taken away from them and were promised to them uh, under the 96 Act, if they did these certain things like have an open, non-discriminatory network, treat their competitors fairly. So a line of business restrictions are gone, but the Act is gone too. The rules aren't enforced. There's two things that are wrong with regulators right now, okay? One, they're not doing enough, and two, they're doing too much. <laughs> A long time ago, a uh, really smart person at the FCC had something to say. Let's see if I can bring it up. You don't read that? Lack of resources is an even more serious problem for state and municipal regulatory bodies. The splintering of jurisdiction between the federal government and the states undoubtedly contributes further to the deterioration of effective coordinated regulation. AT&T is so much bigger and better financed than any government agency it confronts that even the process of selecting which information it will offer the regulator gives the whole operation a substantial aura of self-evaluation. <laughs> The sheer magnitude of Bell is such that very little government regulation is or can be provided by the FCC in the states. To believe otherwise is to encourage the rankest of self-delusion. This is the FCC talk. Well, that's right. Now, I, I don't have to beat this horse. Uh, all I want to say is everybody who has said, look, you know, you guys got it right so long ago, Carter phone, computer inquiry, you had good rules. They, they worked. We're in trouble now because you got rid of it. The 96 Act has been so badly implemented that, you know, there's, there's just a few small, tiny little group of sea legs left barely hanging on, you know. And uh, they're just awaiting the coup de grace. Uh, the FCC won't enforce interconnection rules. It won't enforce half the rules. They're letting the ILEX run the show. I, 
I, I'll tell you one example. I have a client who has an FCC license. It says common carrier interconnected. I go to the ILEC and I say, where do I hook up? They go, you don't have a right to interconnect. But my FCC license says interconnected. Well, we don't believe you. They won't even honor an FCC license for interconnection. And what do I have to do in order to take care of that? I've got to go spend two years litigating at the FCC over whether their license is worth up the, the paper trip. Okay, so what? There's one point that some folks haven't made, and I'm just going to go ahead and drop it in here that, that, that I want you all to kind of understand. <laughs> um, you know, we all talk about competition, and we, we talk about the need for there to be vibrant competition with lots of healthy competitors. And we all understand now, I hope, that we need to focus on having competition where competition might work, but recognize that there's many places in this industry where it just doesn't. It can't. It won't. But let me tell you a little secret. I've been doing regulation for 30 years. Okay, I became a lawyer because I figured I needed to know my enemy. I got into administrative and regulatory law because I found an even bigger enemy. Government hates lots of people in an industry. Things are a lot more tidy when you've got just a few trusted individuals that you can come in and negotiate with and reason with. Life is easy. You build up a nice camaraderie. You understand each other. The last thing any regulator wants is to have to deal with 2,000, this gaggle of geeks. And most of them, you know, look, I, I represent ISPs. I've always done it. I was just regulatory counsel for the Texas ISP Association. Okay? Let me tell you something. They're not the easiest guys to get along with. <laughs> they bathe once a year whether they need it or not. They don't like each other. So, you know, you got to understand how a regulator might perceive that. On the other hand, you've got this, you know, nicely dressed, well-spoken, well-heeled, intelligent person representing the incumbents. It's just easy that way. But then you also got the other problem about what the internet is and what it does. The threat that it poses, not only to the incumbents, but also the government. And I'm now I'm not just talking about regulators. Okay. They have no control over the internet. They have no control over what you do. They, they have a harder time monitoring it. It's kind of difficult to spy on your citizens. If you got 2,000 ISPs out there, it's really easy if you got one. So there's some powerful forces at hand here, not just on account of, you know, a well-greased regulatory machine. There's some really objective reasons why the government may not want a lot of competition out there. It's not that easy to manage. And you do have to manage it. Well, what do we do? Where do we go? Well, we got the situation now where the courts aren't touching any of this stuff because there's this well-greased regulatory machine. And then we got this grease regulatory machine, which isn't enforcing laws. Uh, yeah, we got a new sheriff in town, don't we? We'll see whether things do change. Um, I've seen a lot of sheriffs come and go. And it's a difficult job, even for the people with the best of intentions. And I'm sure they have the best of intentions. I just don't know whether any regulatory system can totally deal with this kind of powerful interest and this kind of money. We need a backstop. So let's talk about the courts again. Courts are a problem. Yeah, they say we got this well-greased regulatory machine. Well, how about if there's a case that says the machine is broken? I got evidence of that. I think there's some more evidence of that in this room. I remember what, eight years ago, we put together a 6,000 page document of all the horrendous things done to the independent ISPs by the incumbents. I mean, the system is broken. And I think that, like Judge Green did when he denied the summary judgment motion of AT&T 
1982. That's what ultimately led to the settlement, by the way, is what he held in that opinion. He recognized that the regulatory system at the time was broken. <coughs> Maybe it's time to start building that case again. Maybe then we can get a court to listen. Maybe then we can get a court to think, well, maybe there is a place for antitrust here. Since this well greased regulatory machine is running over the competitors and running over the users, limiting user choice, raising prices, and putting this country behind in comparison to the rest of the world. But we don't have to just rely exclusively on the courts. Yeah, we got a new sheriff in town, so let's work with the new sheriff. What sorts of things should the new sheriff do? Well, let's see. One, how about deciding some cases? And two, how about enforcing the rules? That'd be a good start, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, uh, okay, step three. Fred already brought it up. You've already brought it up. Let's bring back those rules that made sense, that were wrongly eliminated. It can take several forms. It could be structural separation. It could be line of business restrictions. It could be counting safeguards. It could be anything. These are all really just a slightly different ways of getting essentially at the same thing. I tend to believe in divestiture. I could be talked out of it, okay? But ultimately what we're talking about here is a reimposition of common carrier regulation yeah. on transmission facilities. We don't need to regulate service. Voice today is an application. It doesn't have to be regulated, except perhaps some 911 stuff. We're talking about the basic network connectivity so that people can get on the network and use the, way, the network the way they want to use it, how they want to use it, when they want to use it, as fast as they want to use it, in the direction they want to use it, and talk to whoever they want, including some provider of their own choice. Now, that'd be a good start, wouldn't it? And it's really a couple simple steps. Some of the litigation, if that's done, that would be a long haul. It would be difficult. But it wouldn't be that hard to bring back some common sense regulation. And maybe if that common sense regulation does come to pass, we don't have to pull the trigger on another antitrust case. Scott McCullough, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Okay. This is really late. Let's do anybody got really burning questions. The question is about common sense regulation, early versions of the rules. What about funding of agencies? I, the SEC is an agency I'm familiar with. It's been 20 or more years of, 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 of breaking down the budget, Congress not funding not building the human resources, not, not upgrading the organization, handle a new world. Is that also an issue? And how does that mesh with you know this discussion? It's not just the FCC, but as a lot of people here know. Um, another way to prevent agencies from functioning is to appoint political entities who believe the government shouldn't exist. I totally agree. And that so I mean, it's my impression that the FCC got as much as 95% of the budget it requested every year. The problem was more in where it was allocated and who was running the show. Anybody else want to? Yeah, I'm going to give it to me. Uh, they've got plenty of money. Uh, <laughs> they don't use it well. They don't have a focus. They don't know where the pressure points are. Um, they spin wheels. They override orders. And then they make the critical decision in uh, one or two unsupported lines. And then they get reversed in court. It's, it's, it's a chronic problem with government. Ego creeps in. Uh, plays for, for cover and security creep in, all sorts of fears. These, these, uh, our institutions are not functioning well, and until we acknowledge that and, 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 and try to address those 
root issues, uh, we can't expect better from government. I'm working my way back to the I want to make one observation on the wireless. Um, and maybe we need to change the word to mobile computing. See, what, wireless is not a stopgap or fill in. Mobile computing is and will be a permanent feature of a 21st century uh, communications environment. It just so happens at this moment in time, this dispute between Dave Burstein and I, I was born in the Bronx, I went to City College, I love New York. New York is not the real world, <laughs> okay? The cost of delivering his 200 megabit system in New York is 1 20th of what it is in a quarter of the United States. Um, and so the fascinating thing for me is that wireless or mobile computing is what I call a no regrets investment because not only do I know that it's going to be a useful service, it's future-proof, to use that, that expression, it will be here forever, but it just so happens that in rural America, where actually it costs a heck of a lot less to do, it will also be the mainline internet on ramp. So from my point of view, and that's what we've been fighting hard, we succeeded in stopping the Verizon giveaway in the stimulus package. I have seven billion dollars, and if I do good least cost technologies, not the 200 or the 50, but the least cost technologies, I can actually do a tremendous advance for mobile computing. And for me, that's a least cost um, uh, approach. We're working very hard. The irony is that the rural electric co-ops are actually really interested in doing wireless in rural America. They serve three quarters of the land mass of the United States. My goal is to get as much of that seven billion dollars to those co-ops. I, I would generally agree with everything that you're saying, with the exception that it's maybe three quarters of the land mass of the U.S., but it's a tiny fraction of the population of the U.S. So we should really be focusing on serving the people and not the land in that case. But regardless, I would also bring up the, the point that, and I think I made this point in this slide, that wireless does not exist without landlines. There is no such thing as wireless in rural America to serve all of the great uses that you're absolutely right we need to have, have wireless for if we can't get the internet out there on fiber. Middle mile uh, facilities in rural America are another no regrets investment. Uh, and so those are the two elements that people are, uh, the people I work with are now pushing. The idea of pulling, pulling the fiber down every time you open a road, you pull, you pull the fiber and adding in the, the wireless. To me, that is where we want to go. If Verizon and the cable guys can sell 50 or 100 megabit systems to people, fine. Public money goes to meeting, I call it the subway system of, this, of cyberspace. I rode that subway my whole life, right? No one in 1850 had any idea that this was a 200 year system, right? And go back and look at the history. It's a wonderful rich history of all kinds of different public private partnerships and different technologies. The notion that you're gonna pick a technology serve people for a hundred years is just nuts. Provide basic transportation, and that to me is, is mobile community. I've, I have the follow-up, which is the question that David asked earlier about mesh networking, and even that, couldn't that even dispose of the need for landlines altogether if people are just bouncing using white, white space devices that are Wi-Fi on steroids? It, mesh is a great uh, idea and it is a technology in its infancy and we will see a, a tremendous amount more mesh deployments but overwhelmingly mesh is slower than direct Wi-Fi uh, communication so uh, basically your connection between your router in your home and your laptop being a single point-to-point -point connection is significantly faster than a multi-hop mesh that winds up with a you know, even an enormous so, 
So there's latency issues, there's uh, spectrum spectrum usage issues. We're just we're probably a decade or two away from having truly uh, impressive mesh technologies. And when they come around, they're going to be providing the speeds that we're expecting out of our FIOS today. And so that my point is not that mesh can't be a great op option, but rather that mesh is the option for getting tomorrow, basically, uh, tomorrow getting today's internet in terms of speed and availability. If I could just comment that there's some mesh networks now, they, they always, even the best mesh technology can go several hops without too much latency, but the capacity is shared among all the nodes, so you need ejection points. You need only a certain amount of capacity uh, per ejection point uh, as the uh, mesh near the ejection point gets overwhelmed. So just in terms of capacity, it's a great tool and the technology is improving, but you still need multiple ejection points in a mesh, mesh network, and those could be hard to get in some areas. You know, you know, they don't deliver unless it's to a building, for instance. So you have to put the injection point on somebody's roof and then keep it down. Uh, the mesh networking combined with Lou's community fiber network, that, that might actually work if we can get it. You need a combination, yeah. It's a combination. Seth and then David, and then we'll call it a night. Okay, I'm just trying to be clarifying Simmons and they brought the corporate accountability thing and uh, Brock Berry uh, appropriately uh, wanted to do the corporate first one thing. Uh, I want to point out that the Commerce Clause, which is the angle that I'm, I'm kind of looking at, is actually very indefinite. And uh, you can, I'm not actually centralization or decentralization oriented or federal or state. And the interesting thing is that if you start having a discipline where lawmakers actually put in clauses in their law saying this is what how are you going to address commerce clause issues? Okay, you throw that into the court, they suddenly have to re examine the thing that they've been making decisions about very arbitrarily. They've, just, they've gone for many years saying complete free trade, and since red pens have switched, so it's all arbitrary. You, you, you hold the corporations accountable just by starting to specify commerce clause uh, interpretation. And the let me wrap it up by saying almost all of us are on the same side. Almost all of us are people who are knocking ourselves out. I mean, who the hell Friday nights is through boring lectures? <laughs> Speakers who talk too boring, like me? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All of our business is boring. There are much more exciting things in the world than telephony and internet architecture. Good sorry. Lord! <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, the stuff we know who we actually can have an impact sure. on, there was a billion dollars pulled out of that stimulus that was an absolute giveaway to Verizon for nothing. So let me go back to why, as usual, 99% of the time, Mark is absolutely and totally correct. And in fact, I wrote it a month ago and did all the analysis. By far the best place to spend the stimulus money is where the things weren't being taken care of. And I spent three weeks going over with everybody where it was built, and it turns out that 8% of the homes and a much larger percent of the US land mass do not have wireless towers. By far the most cost effective thing to do with the stimulus, and there's a lot of people inside it who accept this, and I didn't know Mark was pushing the same thing I was. It's great we're both going. For $8 billion, much of which could be coming, because there's a return on this from the people building it, you can have towers getting two megabits to between 98 and 99 percent of the United States. That our beloved president in 24 months can get up and say, we've got two megabits to all but one or two percent, and the cost of that for subsidy is a fraction of that eight billion, it's probably two or three billion, and it's absolutely the best place to spend any money we got, by far. And if, if you liberated the 700 megahertz spectrum in rural America, you would cut the cost in half. And I'm right with you, although it turns out that there's one where we have something to look at. You're absolutely right. The other thing, in fact, I was pushing at the New York Times yesterday, is it is ridiculous 
not to put the conduit in, the $70 billion worth of highways we're doing, New America had a thing, and I ran the numbers based on Australia. It's one-tenth of one percent of the highway cost gives conduit. However, a backhaul turns out to be more expensive than the facilities out there in rural broadband. So backhaul must be dealt with, but best, easiest, most effective way to do that backhaul is to make sure that the fiber that's already in the ground, that mostly belongs to the telephone company, is available to everybody else at a price that is not, this is a real number, 15 times more in Larry, Wyoming than it is in any major city of the United States. And if the way to do that is to come in with a regulation that says, Quest, in Laramie, you have a decent price on your fiber backhaul, so Brett Glass doesn't go out of business and he stops saying yeah. say, crazy things that get us all buffed because You'll they never stop anything. I'll never stop it. Never stop it. Okay, but the wireless towers and the backhaul for the unserved, absolutely first thing that can go there. We're looking at different problems, Mark. I'm looking at the 70, 80, 90 percent of the people. When I look at the set, I believe in helping the last five percent, and your answers are absolutely and 100 percent right for the five percent. And that's where the money should go, and let's make it happen. <laughs>